Okay, um, well thank all of you for, for joining. Uh, this is uh, my presentation. Scouting risk and governance in Major League Baseball. Um, I'll begin by, by a kind of story. Okay, I don't know how many of you are baseball fans, but in, in 1976, Major League Baseball, the first, it was the first season in which Major League Baseball had free agency. Right? So for, for literally decades and decades and decades prior to 1976, uh, ownership of baseball teams would draft a player and basically control their rights for as long as they played. So you have somebody like Hank Aaron, who plays for the same organization his entire career and doesn't really ever make that much money in comparison to what ownership is, is making. Right? Same thing with Stan Musial. Okay? Um, plenty of players out there that would kind of label and highlight that. But in 1976, rather than being uh, forced to spend their entire careers with one team, making a low wage in comparison to what team owners were making, players were able to sell their services on an open market. And that's what's kind of key to this presentation. Right? You have the opening up of baseball to the market relations of economics, basically. Uh, the market would then dictate which players were worth more, and, uh, and those owners and general management wanting the most valuable commodities would need to fork up more money rather than others. So opposed to having Hank Aaron on your team or having Stan Musial on your team, you would have to go out and spend for these players. All right. Well, that obviously kind of changes the game quite a bit. <clears throat> and on this chart, we can, we can kind of trace the ramifications uh, of this moment in 1976 uh, in MLB history by looking at the highest paid salaries across the past 40 years. So, uh, we can get 19, begin in 1976, your highest played player is Hank Aaron, making $240,000. 10 years later, Jim Rice is making $1.97 million, or $1.96 million. 10 years after that, anybody know who this is? Mark McGuire? No. Cecil Brett. Fielder. Ooh. Yes. Ooh. Cecil Fielder. Now known as Prince Fielder's father. Cecil but Fielder. But was making $9.2 million. And then, of course, there was a massive explosion in salaries with A. Rod, Alex Rodriguez in, two, uh, Rodriguez in 2006 making 21.7 million. And in 2016, this upcoming season, the highest played player will be the LA Dodgers' Clayton Kershaw. The, the crafty left hander will be making $34.6 million a year. And that's just baseball salary. Okay. So, as much as we might say that baseball is the forgotten sport, nobody pays attention. These guys make a lot more money than a lot of other sports. Reasons for that very They play more games, too. They play more games, but there's also the regional money that comes from baseball that you don't get with other sports. Right? There's a lot of money in regional cable networks. So, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, because my colleague on this research, uh, Professor Brian Schrader, who's at the University of Michigan Flint, are complete baseball nerds, and we are, right? we're interested in, in how the introduction of free agency impacted the practice of scouting in Major League Baseball. Particularly how those people who had to spend money on players were assessing talent in order to make the best, uh, to, uh, the best financial risk, to, to manage the best risks, right? to ensure that they took the risks that would be fruitful. Again, I want to kind of highlight this. This increase in salaries changes how ownership decides where to spend their money. And when you're spending $34.6 million a year on a player, you have to really, really figure out if, which player you want to spend that on, right? How much worth is that player going to produce? How much wins is that player going to produce? And I'll talk about the development of statistics and assess that. But if you're a baseball fan, uh, there's, a, there's the statistic that is called war. Wins above replacement, which we now assess and we'll use to evaluate whether or not a player is good. In fact, Nolan Arenado, who just won the gold glove for the Colorado Rockies, his gold glove was partly awarded because of his war. He was just better at third base by X amount of games than his replacement, meaning that he caused the Rockies to win that much more games, which is a complete development that comes from the introduction of statistics and economic thought into baseball, particularly baseball scouting and risk assessment. So that's where we kind of go from here. So, in the, uh, in the in the realm of baseball, uh, you have a particularly fruitful kind of uh, uh, object of study because baseball is inherently conservative. Okay, uh, rules take forever to change. Okay, uh, it took Buster Posey breaking his leg in order for Major League Baseball to say, okay, you can't just plow over the catcher. Thirty four years ago, Pete Rose did that. Nobody cared. They called him Charlie Hustle. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but now somebody such as uh, Buster Posey, who makes a lot of money, breaks his leg, the Giants justifiably get upset, the 
rules must change. Instant replay takes forever, right? It's around in football, the NFL, long before it is. It's around in college football, long before it is uh, baseball. <clears throat> um, and then the game is just unbelievably slow. If you're a baseball fan, you know, the games just take forever. All right. Yes, um, I, I enjoy it. But uh, yet, there's also the idea or the, the, the fact that baseball, while being conservative, is on the kind of front edge, right? Or the, or the frontier. It was on the frontier in uh, the kind of late 70s, early 80s on the introduction of statistics into its sport, right? You have statisticians such as Bill James writing uh, the baseball abstract in which he's breaking down baseball into the minutia, right? Using it to kind of, well, you get uh, rotisserie baseball, fa fantasy baseball leagues coming from this where people get together and, you know, pick out players in the same way we do fantasy sports now, but it was all dependent upon statistics, right? With the argument that I don't need the highest paid player, I just need the player that, that produces this and that and this, and we will win, okay? <clears throat> so, um, in our assessment, right, uh, of the situation, we saw baseball as kind of a microcosm of the neoliberal changes happening throughout the United States and the Western world at the end of the 1970s and the early 80s, right? So that's the kind of significance of, of this baseball artifact, right? It is a mirror of what's going on in society, right? in the socio-cultural political world in which we live in where economic thought is beginning to kind of overtake everything else. Uh, <clears throat> so in order to explain such an occurrence and, and what it might actually say about the world outside of baseball, uh, let me first explain uh, Foucault's idea of the technology of governance, uh, the methodology that we're, we're using to assess and approach scouting, and then, second, I will highlight the hidden, persuasive, and in, in influential elements of practices and discourse. I'll get into that momentarily. Third, I will outline the two phases of scouting, uh, known as sabermetrics, and what Brian and I identified as neuroscouting, uh, as distinct but related practices used in the scouting of baseball players, including high schoolers, minor leaguers, and MLB veterans on the market as free agent, agents. And then lastly, I will point out the significance of such governance Governance, if we consider how it is, how it has, and or might be taken up in other spheres of our lives where risk management is required. So you have Foucault and Ron Green, who's the kind of he and Darren Hicks at the at University of Denver, the application of Foucaultian thought to rhetoric. This is Bill James, the father of sabermetrics, and this is Mookie Betts, who I'll get to when I talk about saber or when I got to uh, when I get into neuroscouting. Okay, so technology of governance. Um, to apply uh, Foucault's idea of technology of governance is to pick out one practice, knowledge, discourse, or otherwise identifiable thing, okay, and ask questions such as, what sort of values is it producing, okay, what values is it minimizing, what norms are accepted by this practice, what norms are rejected by this practice, what does it favor, what does it try to eliminate, what kind of norms is it reaffirming or challenging, what are the external productions related to its being in the world? What is it causing? Okay. Now, you might say that sounds really complicated, but the questions you ask really depend upon what perspective you're taking when you begin to use this idea of technology of governance. So, <clears throat> um, at, but, but again, at the end of it all, the technology of governance or the application of it in the study of the technology of governance or a technology of governance answers questions, particular questions such as, how does it function, that act, that knowledge, that practice, to influence the actions of those being governed? And how does the application of the technology itself change from moment to moment, sphere to sphere? All right. So for example, I was trying to think of good examples, and I heard a podcast driving in, sex education. Right? I want to assess sex education as a technology of governance. And I want to know, right? Looking at teenage sex education from this perspective, how might we understand how sex ed works to discipline and scare teens in one moment to not have sex, but then show how sex ed works to inform the decision making of teens and secure manageable rates of teen pregnancy in a different moment. In the former, the goal is to eliminate teen sex. In the, in the, in the latter, the goal is to manage it, right? The technology remains sex ed. But how sex ed is applied to influence the decision making that people make depend upon the situation, right? So is it out of fear, right? This the masturbatory story, which was a video that you would see in a high school 
health class in 1976 that just scared the bejesus out of you, right? You don't have sex. It's a yes or no thing. It's as easy as that. That's very, very different from sex education, which is about informing, right? Telling you here's safe sex, here are the statistics behind it. Because the individual becomes the target here, right? I try to discipline individual bodies. The population becomes the target here. I just want to make sure that X amount of people don't get pregnant if they can't afford to pay for that kid, because then we have to pay for it as a society, right? It's a different approach to governing. It's a different approach to kind of influencing the decisions that people make. <clears throat> so, how is this rhetorical? If we consider that established ways of talking about things and doing those things mold and shape our experiences in the world in the same way that Marx believed that the means of production mold and shape our experiences in the world, then we might come to understand how the rules, regulations, and norms of given discourses, of ways of speaking, of acting, of being in this world, influence and reaffirm how we make sense of the world as much as the words and physical things themselves. Right? So how does being and acting in the world reaffirm norms, practices, in the same way that talking about them adds value to them and reaffirms them? Okay? <clears throat> so we become rhetoricians then, if we look at it this way, this idea of kind of Ron Green's uh, communicative capitalism and uh, uh, communicative materialism. We become rhetoricians when we talk about, when we talk because we are reaffirming. We become rhetoricians when we are acting because we challenge at times, the rules governing communication within a given sphere. So in other words, right, whether or not Bruce Jenner wanted to be, Bruce Jenner communicated, influenced, and persuaded as a rhetorician when he dressed like a man, performing his masculinity and reaffirming the established rules about gender and how it was communicated. And in the same way, you could easily make the argument that Caitlyn Jenner communicates influences and persuades when she dresses like a woman, performing her femininity, simultaneously reaffirming gender norms. How about that? You can make the argument that there's really not that much progressive thought because you have the same gender norms. It's just, right, the fact that it's happening in this, uh, two different ways in the same body. Yeah, okay. Interestingly, right, it's really the middle Bruce, Caitlin, right, that transitional person that is the radical rhetorician because the labeling and the categorization becomes so difficult, right? It is the Bruce Caitlin of the Diane Sawyer interview where she's trying to label and categorize and figure things out that really pushes the boundaries of gender and gender as a technology of government. <clears throat> okay. So, how does the discourse of scouting in Major League Baseball, including the acts of scouting, the words used within the sphere of scouting, reaffirm the various values and powers in place at a given moment in time? In order to answer this question, it is best to look at one particular value affirmed by the technology of governance that is scouting, in particular risk management. It's one of these things, it's kind of an issue with technology of governance. It allows you to unpack very complicated ideas but to actually produce scholarship that is valuable, you have to pick out one thing, right? We pick out risk management, right? That's what we want to look at. So remember, free agency completely changed the amount of risk baseball ownership and management were expected to assume. The new free market first forced owners, general managers, to have to spend money on players rather than locking them into long-term, low-wage contracts. Simply put, they needed to get better at assessing risk at calculating when to spend more money on a player and at what position. In order to do this, they had to find a more effective way to assess talent. The first response was the rise of sabermetrics. All right? So, sabermetrics, in a very, very simplistic way, is the application of statistics to evaluating baseball players, advanced statistics in particular. I'm not concerned with your batting average, how many home runs you hit, or how many RBIs you have, I'm not even concerned about your earned run average. I want to know something way, way more complicated than that. How often do you put balls in play that are line drives? How often do you hit balls to people? How often do you hit pop flies? How often do you swing on the first pitch? How often do you get on base? How often are the hits that you get doubles or better, right? Advanced. Why? Because we know that those hits that are doubles or better have a higher percentage of turning into runs 
runs win games. Therefore, I don't care if David hits 200. If every hit that he gets, every two hits he gets out of 10 is a double because he has a 75% chance of scoring. That's what matters to me. It shatters our idea of what we expect from our baseball players. In fact, it shatters the idea of the Triple Crown. If there are any baseball fans out there, the Triple Crown is given to the player who, I'm sorry, the Triple Crown is when a player has the highest batting average, hits the most home runs, and has the most RBIs. The same player. It's happened once in the last 45 years, I believe, and it was Miguel Cabrera a few years ago for the Detroit Tigers. But when you look at a sabermetrics approach, it doesn't matter. The Tigers aren't winning. They haven't won a World Series since the 80s, right? Miguel Cabrera is a great story, but in terms of how you put your team together, you're just wasting a lot of money on a guy that's not producing a lot of wins, all right? So sabermetrics, the thing that, it eva that evaluates, right? On-field performance, right? You take a body of work, right? <clears throat> the larger the body of work for a particular person whom you're scouting, the better. That's why sabermetricians really like college players. Why would you like college players? You play more games, right? You've played more games than a high school player. If you've ever watched Moneyball, the Billy Bean story about the Oakland A's, mm -hmm. he never wants to draft a high school player because the body of his, uh, that you're assessing is not as large, okay? So you can assess on-field performance, right? How, you know, the larger the body, the more larger the sample size, the more valid the statistics that are drawn from, okay? Uh, then evaluation of the known and post-risk so what I mean by that is, I've already taken the risk on drafting this particular player, perhaps, right? Am I going to decide, do I call him up? Do I put him on the major league roster? Or do I leave him down in the minors and just say it's a lost cause? We paid this guy a signing bonus and he's gone, right? Or maybe I attempt to trade, right, with another team that has put some fella on the shelf because he doesn't appear to be producing the stuff that needs to be produced, and I get a steal. Watch Moneyball. Read the book. Right. The book is way, well, I mean, the book you get a, a deeper understanding right. of sabermetrics than you do the movie. But the idea that those, I, those, those general managers, owners who have access to the data that sabermetrics produces, they have a leg up, right? They can know what wins, and they can get a steal. They can make a trade, right? They get somebody that everybody else has overlooked. Are they using so, that in football, uh, It's an interesting question. A little bit. Basketball is actually kind of, uh, the NBA is, is actually kind of uh, starting to use statistics way more than football. Why? Not sure. I think um, it really comes to me, right, as Brian and I understand it, baseball salaries are so much larger as a whole than other sports that it has forced ownership, those who are spending money, to more effectively manage risk, right? There isn't necessarily that need. Especially in football, because you have no guaranteed contracts. If you're not doing what I want you to do, I'll just cut you. I don't have to pay you, right? Baseball, basketball, that's not the case, right? You're paying somebody that contract that you sign. It's a kind of product of the system itself. Right? So our first step is we kind of analyze sabermetrics as a neoliberal type of governance of baseball, right? Trying to assess the body of work in order to effectively get the right type of data it will allow me to eliminate or at least best manage risk in the future, right? Think about <clears throat> turns towards effectively managing retirement portfolios, okay? Or the type of students that we take in at Metropolitan State University, right? We use past data to understand the present. Now, neuroscouting, completely different. It's a new phase of risk management. With neuroscouting, you are concerned with the cognitive performance of those whom you are scouting. The pre-risk taking involved, and on-field performance is not needed. Right? With neuroscouting, right? Neuroscouting is a new science. That is, it, there's, a, there's a company called Deservo, okay, uh, which is a New York-based neuroscouting uh, firm. You go, and it happens a lot with high school baseball players, and you put a cap on a ball player and you figure out how fast can that ball player react to the seams of a baseball. I don't need you to swing. I don't need anything. That thing that I put on your head and the data that is produced through those through your neurons tells me all I need. This does several really? things, right? It, 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 it does a lot of kind of wild things. Well, <clears throat> it kind of levels the playing field from the rich Kessels in the world out there who are facing 95 mile an hour fastballs in high school, 
okay, and the Karen Lawlers out there who might just be facing 75 mile an hour fastballs. Not either of their faults, right? It's just the fact that, you know, Karen looks really good when she's hitting 75 mile an hour fastballs. Many of us could. Now, Rich hits a 95 mile an hour fastball. That's something to really hang your hat on. But I level the playing field because it doesn't matter. It's our reaction time. The second thing about this is you can't make people's cognitive abilities faster, right? You can train a little bit. You can work on it. But not in the same way you can kind of train the physical body, right? You're not going to the gym. You're not taking 100 cuts a day in the, in the batting cage, right? I know, right? I know what Eric's capacity is when I put that hat on him. I know whether or not I should take the risk or I shouldn't. Right? And so I'm evaluating talent before that talent even gets on the field. So it's right? even potential, isn't it? It's potential. Mm -hmm. It's managing potential. It's governing potential. It's a complete, di well, I don't want to say complete. It is an evolved version of sabermetrics in a lot of ways, but it's certainly different. Right? Different in kind. Different in kind. Right? So, neuroscouting. <clears throat> Okay, so what is the significance of this, right? Brian and I being rhetoricians, what does it matter in terms of the world outside of baseball? So sabermetrics, again, involve breaking down the physical human performance into parts and evaluating those parts. Within its limits, physical performance can be improved. Baseball players can lift more weights, can take more cuts. But what if that is not the issue? What if, it is, what if, all cognitive, what if it's all up to cognitive performance? That's not as easy to improve. So as I mentioned, neuroscouting eliminates that guessing game, right? Ownership, management, they're more aware of the risk. They have those advanced statistics. So what is the result, right? Those tangibles, the extras, the Tim Tebow just wins even though he has no talent component, <laughs> right? Are now measurable. We can now know the human animal inside and out through technology, through their body of work. In turn, not only might it influence how we take risks with other people, but how other people take risks on us. Perhaps most importantly, it changes how we take risks on ourselves. This, sta this standardized test that I just took tells me I'm no good at math. So therefore, I'm not going to study math when I go to college. I'm going to be afraid of it to take that class. I'm going to hold off to I'm a senior. Right? Maybe this study shows that some social documentary might change my opinion on global warming, so I best not just avoid it. Right? And maybe science tells, tells me that some biases are inherent, so I should make no reasonable attempts to change my mind. Right? Think about the impact of this approach, right? how it influences us in ways outside of sports. So it might eliminate within that realm of sports the busts like the Ryan Leafs of the world, the Greg Odins of the world, and you Rockies fans, the Denny Nagels of the world. Okay? Denny Nagel was paid $51.5 million for five years, and during that five years, he started 65 times, went 19 and 23, and had a 5.57 ERA. You, you do the math. That's not worth $55 million. The Rockies <laughs> typically get paid. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> so, where are you? All right. So, in the end, right, why is this significant? For items like that. Okay. These things, they happen within the realm of sports, they happen within the realm of baseball. But Brian and I kind of understand them as potentials, if how they are applied in the game are then applied to life outside of the game. But again, at the end of the day, we probably don't have anything to worry about just yet. 